Welcome back to another exciting episode of Cyber Defense TV. I'm your host, Gary Malefsky, and the publisher of Cyber Defense Magazine. Sitting in my hot seat today is a very special guest, Edgar Captiviel. He is the president and CEO of Nozomi Networks. If you're worried about visibility from IoT to IT to OT, he's going to tell us about how to stop the bad guys and really maybe level set, Edgar. Tell us what OT is for those who aren't really sure of what OT security is all about. Absolutely. Uh, Nozomi Networks, we actually started our life doing specifically OT security. And OT really refers to those industrial control networks that protect all of our critical infrastructure from electric utilities, oil and gas, all sorts of manufacturing, whether it's automotive, pharmaceutical, but, but also all sorts of human transportation, whether it's maritime, uh, ports, airports, industrial control networks are, are everything. The, the term OT which I'll use interchangeably with, with ICS, stands for Operational Technology and, and ICS, Industrial Control Systems. It's, it's all about uh, automation networks that support critical infrastructure. After you spend some time in, in OT or ICS, you'll realize how prevalent and, and common the market is. You start seeing the electrical substations that deliver electricity to your house, the water substations, the gas substations, how trains and rail and everything around us, um, OT it can be as big and if not bigger than IT. And that's the the big uh, learning from spending time on this space. So Edgar, what you're saying is pretty much every aspect of our lives uh, from food, critical infrastructure, maritime, mining, transportation, data centers, pharmaceutical, the whole shebang, anybody who has physical uh, infrastructure and turns something on Maybe it turns the lights on for all of us, the electric company, or it turns on the trains or the boats, transportation, the data centers, all this stuff. They all have to connect to the cloud or to the internet. And do they, did they need to move this OT stuff? Did they need to connect it on the TCP IP stack? Was that a smart move? Well, listen, I think, uh, so let's, let, I'll start by saying I spent most of my career, all of my career on the IT side of the house. I started my career with data management, uh, data infrastructure, then I transitioned to security. And of all the different jumps that I made, jumping to industrial cybersecurity has been the biggest jump. It's that different. Uh, the buyers are different. Um, in the world of IT, the deployment of infrastructure has been evolving together with the deployment of security for that particular infrastructure. We could be talking about the deployment of networks and then the deployment of, of uh, network security. They've gone in tandem, and, and the bad guys and the protection has, has evolved together. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, industrial networking and uh, critical infrastructure interconnectivity was, was late to adopt TCP IP. Uh, and for the longest time, uh, the, the evildoers, the hackers, were not really targeting those systems. One, because it was it had a natural uh, air gap. Uh, with different uh, technology. Um, once it adopted TCP IP, the concept of air gap really became a real detriment because it's no longer existent, but it exists in people's minds. So, it, so it's really bad detriment. But again, the world really, really changed with um, the, the public expression of it was colonial pipelines, right? When folks realized that your uptime can be monetizable if you care about it, um, and and the use of ransomware and even to the cryptocurrencies to some extent changed the world of, of critical infrastructure. Now we really, really need to protect it. And we have not been evolving the investment in critical infrastructure with, this, with the security for critical infrastructure. So critical infrastructure is everywhere. It's potentially as big as IT, but we haven't really deployed the cybersecurity required. So the exposure and the vulnerability, it's really large. And and isn't some of that equipment, which again, it can open up valves for chemical mixtures for cleaning and and, and also the risk of tampering with water supplies, of, as we've seen by a hacker who attacked a watershed in Florida to, you know, moving trains on tracks. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, I've been even told that the 777s or 787 jets are now flying data centers, right? They're not just they're not just airplanes anymore. They're flying data centers. So really, and the some of the equipment, the chips and the hardware for, for manufacturing to do OT 
they're not really hardened and the protocol is not really that it wasn't designed for security. It's kind of like SMB one versus SMB two in the windows uh, security protocol stack where, you know, WannaCry got into a healthcare provider on the IT side and took the whole network down in uh, uh, healthcare.gov.uk. So uh, it's pretty risky, isn't it? That, that, that is right. And I think uh, one of the points that you were making there is that OT is is starting to blur with with IoT. If you look at an, an OT network, uh, a critical infrastructure network that that is, you know, automated, has industrial controls in it. Well, number one, there are IT devices in that network. Not everything is is a PLC or 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 a piece of automation equipment. You do have some IT um, gear. Some of the uh, human interface uh, terminals are are PCs. Uh, the the skin masters the there are several PCs uh, laying around the historians for example so the traditional ransomware um, malware issues exist uh, and one of the things that is happening now is that the world of IoT which is different from the world of OT um, is also starting to blur so we're starting to get IoT devices you know video cameras barcode readers tablets. Uh, thermostats, all sorts of IoT devices into our plants, into our critical infrastructure. So one of the things we've discovered that, you know, even though we grew up in the world of OT, we've actually been doing IoT for a while. It's very rare to find an industrial control network that has no IoT devices. And very similarly, even if you were to go into a pure play IoT opportunity, you find some OT somewhere, whether it's the HVAC, the the building automation system, some sort of access controls. The, the world of OT and IoT uh, are blurring. They're going to blur faster than, than the world of IT. And uh, we see uh, our opportunity expanding. So it's converged, but it's not resilient. It gives us faster access to information. You can remotely change the temperature in your building. All these great technologies, remotely check on the cameras or employees accessing the the card readers and all that good stuff. And there is a blur, but uh, it's not really resilient. What can Nozomi Networks do to give us the resiliency visibility? Are there devices that should be here and resiliency given the, the convergence? Yeah, uh, let's first talk about why it isn't resilient, right? So when you look at the world of IT, the world that we're really familiar, internet, database servers, application servers, your corporate networks, um, those networks, IT networks, are defined by their endpoints. If you look at the endpoints, whether it's my laptop, an application server, your phone, we're really talking about supercomputers with a with an incredible CPU and a full stack operating system. And, and that really means that the network, the, the set of network services that are going to exist are going to be very sophisticated. You can have very proactive, uh, active specifically network services. Right, you can have scanning, you can have blocking, you can have interruptions, and the conversations between devices can can handle it. When you look at the world of OT or the world of IoT, those two fundamental assumptions change. You have a very very limited resource constrained CPU that was designed for a single purpose. Think of a video camera in the case of IoT, or or a PLC device in the case of an OT network. And then when you talk about an operating system, I mean, that's almost a joke. It's not, that's not an operating system, right? That's, that's some sort of piece of firmware with some code. And you can't run an agent in there. Those, those devices are not made to be, to be scanned or, or to be questioned freely. And the impact is that they may reset, they may behave erratically, and that cannot happen in a plant. It's just not allowed. So. The world of IT security from its beginning evolved in active mode. So active scanning, active probing, active questioning, what firmware level are you in? And, and everybody was okay with that. And like I said, if you had a hiccup here and there, it was not a big deal. Uh, but the world of OT, first of all, it grew up without cybersecurity, right? Because we already talked about initial natural barriers uh, associated with networking technology, and then the lack of um, profits, right? There was no money, there was no credentials. The ransomware plus cryptocurrency effect that is publicly reflected with colonial pipelines had not occurred. Those two things are not true. So now we're trying to catch up. 
solutions from the IT world don't really work because they're active. We can't have them come in and shut down our plants. That's why Nozomi Networks uh, has been really successful because we've created a passive technology from scratch that is designed for OT. Uh, in our space, you'll see that anybody who wants to play in our space, even if you're some of the largest network security vendors in IT, if you're gonna enter our space, so far, only people have done it via acquisition uh, because you'd really truly have to create a product from scratch. And in a, in a larger company, it's really impossible to say, I'm gonna start working from scratch that is not going to leverage what I'm already doing, right? So um, that's why our space uh, is was full of, of early entrants and Nozomi, Nozomi has been one of those companies that has now taken the leadership role in the space of OT and IoT security. Now, just to, for some of our viewers and listeners, passive versus active, you you grab an Nmap and you Nessus and you crash the print server, right? You, oh, I found the print server, I got the MAC address, but I crash it. If that were, you know, an operating room piece of gear, you really can't go active probing. So you have to be very innovative. And Nozomi's got a way to passively, which means it's really happening in real time, but you're aware of assets as they come and go. And now do you detect their weaknesses, their vulnerabilities, and, and do you help harden or defend against the exploits that are out there that could really cause human harm? Loss that's, of that's correct. So that's correct. That's the difference between passive and active. Imagine that this was a network, you and me talking right now. So the active, uh, um, the corresponding active solution would be a third person entering into this conversation and starting asking questions to, to you and me. And then, you know, we're, we have a good CPU, we have good software, um, so we can answer those questions. The passive example would be, well, we can't see anybody, you know, this interview is being recorded. Somebody's watching a recording of this conversation. And based on what you can hear, you create your asset inventory, you create your vulnerability map, you, you, you basically ascertain everything that you need to ascertain on the network. Now, the world is evolving. For example, today we do have a module for active probing. We call it smart polling, as the name implies. It does uh, active um, pinging in a very selective way, only after we've exhausted all of our passive techniques. It does it in the dialect of the particular device, and it does it minimally, just to just to close any gap that you may have in in the way that that device is expecting it. So most devices, for example can share their diagnosis information. Um, Windows machines can tell you what patch level they have and so forth. So customers that have gone through the passive experience can now go to an experience active. And then very similarly, our space really started on premise where the word cloud was forbidden. But as you get comfortable with the solution, then, then you get a lot more comfortable sending data to the cloud using artificial intelligence and, and you know, doing a lot more. For example, quickly deployed on a smart city. If the cities can get smart, uh, they definitely need the Zomi network. So uh, quickly, how fast and how easy it is to deploy and get a proof of value and say, look, we found devices on the network that have issues. Is it a week? Is it a month? Is it five minutes? How do we get deployed? In a, in a, in a proof of value, um, it, we can actually do it fairly quickly is not as quick as in the world of IT where you can simply deploy an agent or, or change a configuration to reroute traffic. Here, the world is physical. So you have to get to the industrial control network. You have to create, you know, have a span port, mirror port or network tap access. And then once you're getting a copy of the data, then, then you're rolling. It's very rarely when we have a proof of value and we don't find something that is shocking to, to the customer, whether it is a CMC communication over to a country that isn't supposed to be happening, active, you know, malware moving around in the in the um, control network, public connections to the internet, all sorts of things, open password, uh, you know, default passwords going back and forth, uh, un unauthorized access. It is very rarely that we don't find something. So we're we're slowly but surely demolishing this perception that. You know, we're safe because we're air gapped and nobody's really targeting these networks. So is that so on a case by case basis, do you have threat Intel research hunters or do you have, you know, people, consultants that help set things up? Do you work with MSSPs or MSPs? How, how, how do folks get a hold of the Zomi networks and get deployed? 
Yeah, absolutely. We we are extremely proud of our partner ecosystem. About 80% of our business is, is um, fulfilled and, and delivered uh, via partners. We have on one side a two-tier distribution model um, that, that reaches customers globally uh, through their local VARs. But we also work with our global strategic alliances, which include some of the uh, larger system integrators in the world, whether we're talking about the Accentures, the IBMs, the Deloitte's, the, the Ernst & Young's, the NTT's, uh, all sorts of Atos, all sorts of folks uh, globally, Mandiant, I'm gonna, I'm gonna forget somebody and they're gonna get upset. But uh, some of the most, uh, we're, we're, we have a strong uh, partner ecosystem. And I think uh, what makes our partner ecosystem solid is that we just don't sign an agreement and we're done we have requirements for uh, ecosystem partners to have what we call Nozomi certified engineers on staff. And that's a very serious uh, certification that Nozomi provides. You need a test to even start the program, and then you need a test to exit the program. And when we tell somebody that they are a Nozomi certified engineer, which is the base certification, there's other certifications for managed services, for uh, other things. Then, then they are um, at the right level of skill set to deploy Nozomi networks in an industrial control facility. That is wonderful. And Edgar, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to share with our viewers and listeners? Well, listen, the, the pace of innovation in this space is, is pretty aggressive. We've introduced uh, our cloud uh, SaaS application a couple of years ago. It's been uh, one and a half full, really full year of revenue. Uh, you can call it two years. And, uh, and in our last quarter, it represented a third of our new business and a third of the POVs. So for having a brand new product become a third of, of your opportunities means that, A, the market is ready and that innovation is happening. Back in January, Nozomi Networks, for all of our existence, had been a network solution with network sensors. But in January, we introduced our first endpoint sensor. So, so just like in the network, endpoint security had not been able to penetrate the world of OT because it was not designed for OT. So the very first OT endpoint was, was introduced in January by, by Nozomi Networks. And now we combine endpoint security with network security, becoming the very first XDR solution, if you will, in the space. We have a very excited announcement that we did during during RSA, which was Ethos. Uh, we announced that with the rest of the community, some of our competitors, some of our partners, and with CISA, which is a, Ethos is a, a nonprofit uh, third-party organization that um, Nozomi is a member of. And we are there to help establish some of the formats for a threat intelligence exchange of, of you know, zero day style information as, as soon as they're detected. And, uh, and that was pretty exciting. That was actually really unique. And then we have more exciting announcements around artificial intelligence applied to uh, industrial and IoT cybersecurity coming up later this month. And so the pace of innovation here is fantastic. That, and that is wonderful. You guys are really a market leader and an innovator in, in the convergence of IoT and OT security. We need better visibility. We need to get one step ahead of the next threat. And that is what Nozomi Networks does. So folks... Uh, and again, I have to thank you, Edgar Captaviel. You are the president and CEO of Nozomi Networks. Go to his website today, nozominetworks.com, and then come back next time for an exciting episode of Cyber Defense TV. Cyber Defense TV and Cyber Defense Radio have launched 24 by 7 by 365 live streams. Visit them online today at cyberdefense.tv and cyberdefense.radio with your host and globally recognized cybersecurity expert and my good friend, Gary Milewski.